Godzilla is one of modern art's greatest phenomenons. For the last 65 years, this beast has been a staple part of our culture. He can be seen anywhere, from his infamous movies to his numerous video games, even physically memorialized in many different places throughout the world. He's clearly made an impact on the ones that have been influenced by him in one way or another, and all while continuing to grow and evolve to fit the world we live in. He's been the physical representation of the devastations brought to us by mankind and war. The incarnation of revenge for the inhumanities that devastated civilizations. And even a modern day political statement on the incompetence of the Japanese government. But now, he's being reintroduced in a way we've never quite seen him before. What if we take that monster that was born from our failures, our sins, and made that monster into the Earth itself? The Godzilla Earth Trilogy, consisting of Godzilla Planet of the Monsters, Godzilla City on the Edge of Battle, and Godzilla the Planet Eater, introduces a monster that embodies divine punishment for the sins of humanity, and stands as an antagonistic force that takes humanity's home away from them. With the dramatic stakes being higher than ever for a Godzilla film, one would expect the quality of these films to be of the upper echelon that the franchise has produced. Unfortunately, these three films are among some of the most polarizing in the Godzilla franchise, and after having watched them, I can certainly see why. So today, I'd like to talk about these films, talk about what it is that makes them so polarizing, what works and what doesn't work, the reaction towards them, and just generally my opinion for each individually, and then together as a trilogy. And a fair warning ahead, these films will likely be discussed in their entirety. And I will be digging into them pretty harshly, so just keep in mind that for the most part, this is only my opinion. But anyway, now that that's taken care of, let's start with where it all begins. Godzilla Planet of the Monsters. Godzilla Planet of the Monsters introduces us into a world where the battle against Godzilla has already been lost. A world where the people of Earth have been forcibly exiled by the looming manifestation of destruction. This is the story of Captain Haro Sakaki, an angered soul with nothing in his mind other than defeating Godzilla, claiming back his precious planet, and recovering the lost pride of his people. And all this while clashing egos with other leaders of humanity that are aboard the ship that they have been forced to. Basically, just think After Earth, but with less Will Smith and more Godzilla. On paper, the premise here seems like a surefire emotional tale of human struggle, the retribution of nature against man, and plenty more interesting subjects while throwing in the over-the-top Godzilla destruction that has become synonymous with the monster. However, in execution, Despite the interesting symbolism and themes that I enjoy in my art, I just can't find it within myself to say that the overall product works, and I'm not alone in feeling that way. You can look just about anywhere and see the same result from just about every single outlet. It was a massive, massive disappointment with the most common word being thrown at it was boring. And again, I'd have to agree. Throughout the film, I couldn't help but feel like the plot just meanders for most of its runtime. Not to mention, the characters feel distinctly static with nothing of note to push them anything beyond average at best. Then there's also the lack of any real action or conflict from the thing that people basically came to see. Playing devil's advocate, it's fair to say that these issues do probably take root from the fact that it is the first entry in a trilogy, and therefore only setting itself up as the foundation for the future installments. However, it just doesn't feel like that's the case, and instead gives me this feeling that I'm being cheated out of an experience I was looking for. 
I feel like it would be very fair to say that this film simply just doesn't warrant existing. And I know that's a particularly harsh critique, but let me go ahead and explain why I feel this way. As mentioned before, this story follows protagonist Captain Haro Sakaki, whose blinding rage against Godzilla leads the humans, and some generic humanoid aliens, back to Earth in the hopes of defeating the monster and reclaiming the Earth. However, before those events, the film starts with the incarceration of the captain for threatening to destroy the entire ship. You know, for funsies. Well, it's actually because he believes that the other leaders aboard the ship sent out a group of the elderly to explore a possible new planet for everyone to live on. And it goes up in flames. Jason X style. It is only through a plan to destroy Godzilla that he made while in his prison cell that he's able to be freed and take charge once again. So here, we're already presented with a pretty big issue that's going to plague the rest of the series. And that is that the hero of the story is really, really unlikable. There's not really much to relate to in terms of his wants. His extremism is very unapologetic. Hell, even when it comes to things like his design, he's just very... flat. This film builds him up as being very one note and having only one objective in mind. And while that isn't always necessarily a bad thing, for this story, it feels like it just needed more. While there are seeds planted here that build towards things we'd see later on, it just doesn't justify how uninteresting this character is, especially in this film. Now let's go ahead and talk about another issue that this film presents. That being the fairly uninteresting conflicts that usually have no resolution. There's one scene I find in particular that sums up my feelings towards this issue very well. Right after Haro's release post-devising his plan to kill Godzilla, he and the committee of leaders meet up to discuss the specifics of how they plan to defeat Godzilla. In running this down, Haro mentions the resources he's going to need which includes a staggering 600 out of the 4,000 people on the ship. The main leader of the ship immediately shoots this option down very adamantly saying that it is completely out of the question. The very next shot is a hard cut to a force of 600 people preparing for the battle against Godzilla. <sighs> the scene certainly doesn't feel like it's being played for laughs, just considering how the whole series is completely void of comedy or any dynamics and tone really. Which, I should add, only makes it feel like more of a slog to sit through. It simply hard cuts to the next scene, completely robbing us of the emotional drama and stakes at hand here. I even made a note to check and see if this is any different in the English dub, but no. This is nearly a fourth of the population and in a mere instant, it is completely disregarded. It just feels sloppy and uncaring where I feel it could have built an interesting, dramatic aspect to the story. There's already an established distrust between Haruo and the other leaders, so I don't see why you wouldn't build off the foundation you've already started. It would add a whole new dynamic into play on top of the battle against Godzilla that would make their possible triumph feel that much more rewarding. It's just extremely jarring and confusing to see all this buildup come to nothing. And there's no better way to describe that feeling than to talk about the ending. In the ending, the military force is giving Godzilla everything they've got in order to defeat him, using every single weapon in their arsenal to trap and kill him once and for all. It seems almost miraculous when they succeed, putting in all the effort possible to defeat this all-powerful monster. They assume that they've achieved victory, the nightmare is over, and they've regained their stolen planet. What they don't know is that California is home to the San Andreas Fault, an area where the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate- So out of nowhere, a Godzilla of astronomical height and stature erupts from the ground and immediately defeats the remaining force with his grand appearance alone. 
Haruo and his team look up at this godlike creature in defeat, and then the film cuts to black. So for all these emotional stakes, all this drama built up, is this a satisfying conclusion? I definitely say not. I like the idea of this group of people putting their all against a monster that has created so much pain and suffering, and in the end, because even though they achieve victory, it's only for an even larger threat to arise. In the grand scheme of things, this just feels like an ending to hold us over until we get to the actual story, and that largely has to do with the fact that it feels like very little of consequence is taken from this very moment. The smaller Godzilla creature is hinted to be one of many, but yet, they are never seen again. Godzilla's amazing stature immediately takes out the forces through his presence alone, but this is never done again. And to top it all off, the film just ends abruptly and distractingly, almost as if they just didn't know how to end it and they would just figure it out in the start of the next film. In the moment, the cliffhanger ending is somewhat interesting just because you don't expect it. However, when you look at the big picture, it's distracting to see how much of a narrative effort they put into avoiding narrative effort. They constructed an entire story to build just how much of a behemoth this monster really is, yet they fall short of showing that off beyond this very point. It's honestly just kind of sad to me because there are a lot of ideas here that I think greatly complement the symbolism Godzilla carries. Not only that, but when you take this world that has grown to evolve around Godzilla, essentially becoming Godzilla, it just calls into question if humanity is really there to reclaim the Earth, or if they're only there to destroy it again. Themes like these certainly aren't omitted from the franchise. In actuality, they're plentiful, and I do quite like how these questions are actually challenging and make me ponder on the complexities this story carries. But that's where the real big issue comes into play, because it's my belief that no matter how interesting, how complex, or how emotional the themes and subjects of a film are, if you can't portray those same interesting factors, those same complexities, or the same emotions in the story itself, it's just not going to work. It's fair to say that general audiences aren't watching these or really any movies for deep analysis or profound introspection. But in order for a film to be able to win an audience's interest on that level, it carries the responsibility of things like narrative and character that lead them into finding what the film is trying to say. And like I stated before, most audiences just found this film to be dull in every aspect of the film, so why would they look into something that already doesn't appeal to them? Unfortunately, this is going to be something we see throughout the rest of these films. That being this over-concentration on ideas and substance over everything else, and the films suffer because of it. That being said, we might as well move on to the next installment in the franchise. Godzilla City on the Edge of Battle is probably the most consistent entry into this series. It establishes some narrative points and concepts in ways I found to be much more interesting and well executed than in Planet of the Monsters. It seems where Planet was focused on the idea of man versus man versus Earth, this one has more of a feeling of man versus technology versus Earth. With that, there actually comes some themes and character progression that works well within the specific film. As to whether or not it fits into the entire narrative, 
Well, we'll discuss that later. Regardless, this story picks up directly after Godzilla Earth defeats the humanoids, and Haro awakens to find himself in the home of a humanoid species that has been living on Earth after the real humans left. It turns out that they're actually a bunch of bugs that evolved to practically become humans. That might sound like the start of a joke, but I'm not kidding. They're literal bugs. This introduction leads the original humans to find the bug people's underground lair, where we see the first real semblance of religion come into play, something that will become important in the final movie. It is here where they discover remnants of a technology that one of the alien races was planning to use against Godzilla. The remnants being a part of the forgotten Mecha Godzilla. This technology is called nanometal, and it's basically just some hardcore metal that turns most things it touches into more nanometal. With the main thing being Godzilla, but we'll find that there's a good few exceptions to that rule later on. I guess now would be a good time to explain who these alien races are exactly. In the humanoid group, we have the disgusting disease of a species. They're known as humans. The kinda Heaven's Gate group of people are called the Bilisaludo, or that's how I assume you pronounce it. And the last group, which is a mix of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Fascist Party, the Exif. Exif? Ex I won't go into detail as to what they're all about. But for the purpose of this story, the Bilisaludo are a cold bunch that are as close to machines as they can possibly be, and have a cult-like devotion to higher technologies. They're the ones that will focus on the idea of the technological expansion of oneself, or something like that. Anyway, they head to find Mechagodzilla, and find out that the nanometal from it has covered such an extensive area that the area is dubbed Mechagodzilla City. I guess they thought that people wouldn't be able to figure out that it's a metaphor for how the cities we construct create a never-ending cycle of construction that eats away at the very earth we stand on, destroying the very foundation we've built upon. Well, I'm not stupid, movie. I'll have you know that I'm going for a bachelor's in fine arts, and I'm going to be the best jack-in-the-box manager this world has ever seen. Godzilla wakes up from his randomly placed slumber, and can sense the people at Mechagodzilla City for some reason. The humanoids then start to weaponize the entire city, Haruo falls in love with the super generic sergeant lady, the Bilisaludo start channeling their inner martial Applewhite, and then they're good again, and then the battle between technology and Earth begins. It's more or less the same strategy employed in the last film, but on a much bigger scale, and with a whole lot more Godzilla killing metal in play. Everything seems to be according to plan, until Godzilla starts heating up tremendously. In what I must admit is one of few absolutely spectacular looking shots, and the Bilisaludo decide to become antagonistic again, fusing with the nanometal and forcing Haro and Yuko to do the same. This is where the central theme of this movie comes into play, as the nanometal is quickly overpowering Godzilla, and the earth around it. The attempted theme being that in order to defeat a monster, to defeat your demons, you must be cautious of not becoming a monster yourself. This is when the ex-chief priest, Metaphys, practically spells that out for Haro, and therefore the audience, and he breaks free of the nanometal. As for Yuko, she just kind of stops fusing with it for whatever reason. Haruo then proceeds to shoot down the base where Mechagodzilla City was being controlled, and allows a very winnable battle against Godzilla to be lost. He then lands, starts crying over Yuko's dead body, and then the movie cuts to black. So, how does this entry fare in comparison to its predecessor? Well, I'd definitely say that for the most part, it works much better. If anything, this actually feels like a significant chunk to the overall story, as opposed to just being a weak setup. 
The themes and ideas presented here don't come at nearly as much of a narrative sacrifice like it did in Planet of the Monsters. There's some really nice usage of color that made some shots look striking. Motivations are more properly established, development is still slow but certainly happening, and the world is starting to become more and more interesting with lore now introduced with the inclusion of the bug people. Which finally gives us an excuse to care about this world in the slightest. That being said, this movie still suffers from not only the failures of the previous installment, but also entirely new ones that cripple things like tension and conflict. At some points, in even worse regard than in Planet of the Monsters. For instance, the beginning of the film immediately establishes the threat of Godzilla's atomic breath being able to hit and destroy the main ship. This threat is maybe repeated once or twice, but never actually reaches any dramatic conclusion or has any real plot relevance for that matter. It attempted to establish tension that they then proceeded to do nothing with. And it ultimately feels like a means of fluffing up the script just to add another plot point. A plot point, I should add, that wouldn't even be relevant. Another example is the one that I've already hinted at before, with the Bill Saluto just conveniently changing from protagonistic to antagonistic and back again at the tip of a hat in the same scenes at certain points. What bothers me about this is that at no point does this alien race ever even show malicious intent in Planet of the Monsters. They show complete and utter faith in the captain guiding them towards Godzilla's defeat. In this story, they now prioritize the mission over the captain and proceed to basically betray him by the end. But before that point, there's this bickering about whether or not the humans should fuse with the nanometal. Because doing so would likely guarantee a victory against Godzilla, but also make them lose themselves. Thus turning themselves into the monster they're trying to defeat. However, the filmmakers fall into the same trap as they did before. They write themselves into corners, they poorly establish plot points, and keep creating conflicts and not doing anything with them. It honestly just makes for a really, really frustrating viewing experience. Moving on to another issue, which I feel might be most well suited to talk about with this film, is the animation. So, I'm sure it hasn't escaped you that these films are not 2D animated, but rather 3D CG animated films. And I don't know how familiar you are with this type of animation, but more often than not, it's an animation style that tends to be reviled by most fans. And I can certainly see why. I can remember the Berserk anime receiving so much criticism when it first came out. And one of the most critiqued things about the anime was the 3D CG animation. It just comes to show how some of the most beloved things can quickly turn into something hated simply through its presentation. In order to explain why I feel 3D CG animation doesn't quite work here, let's first take a look at one of the most beautifully animated films I've seen recently, Dragon Ball Super Broly. The animation here is absolutely stunning. It simplifies the designs to their most basic, with striking colors, amazing scenery, and majestic fluidity. It's insane seeing just how much energy is put into every little movement that gives those movements such character. This, I find, is one of the greatest strengths of 2D animation. In being able to exaggerate and manipulate these characters' movements to whatever the animators wish, there's an extra level of impact that you just don't see from the 3D CG animated moments of these movies. In comparison, they seem very stiff and choppy. Even smaller things like textures are constructed in a way that makes them distracting. That being said, Dragon Ball Super Broly probably has the best 3D CG animation around. Aside from the absolutely amazing animation in Expelled from Paradise, obviously, and that's probably because of the ways the people behind it attempted to mask it with more 2D animation. Here, in this trilogy, it's basically nothing more than pure 3D CG, and while I feel that this animation does lend itself more towards the grounded, realistic stuff, that still doesn't rid it of its awkwardness. 
This film in particular shows the whole range of 3D CG animation strengths and weaknesses. While there are some very good looking shots of a burning Godzilla and the Vulture's first time in action, there's also the absurdly still human animation, the distracting choppiness of movements, and the inability to exaggerate emotion beyond its most simple form, and even then still looking strange. I understand that a lot of these issues are ones that will likely be fixed as this type of animation finds its footing more and more down the line. But there are some things here that seem inexcusable for having the focus that they do, when the time spent there should have gone towards something else that really needed it. There's just one thing in particular that I cannot, for the life of me, understand why they did. And it's the stupidest thing. But it comes off as almost a slap in the face that they decided to dedicate time to this instead of literally anything else. So, what is it that I'm talking about? They took the time to undress the sergeant lady and give her very intricate, very subtle movements to her chest for every step she takes. <sighs> Again, it seems so dumb, but when you look at some of the worst looking moments of this film, of which there are plenty of, you just ask yourself, why would they focus on that? Why would you give this lady elaborate boobs when the captain is walking around like he just finished taping a session of <sighs> At the end of the day, I feel like the decision to make everything 3D CG animation was not a good idea. And the key word in here being everything. Something about the choppiness and the stiltedness of Godzilla's movements I feel actually adds to his presence making him feel much more gargantuan, and makes all of his movements feel like they take a lot more effort to do. The scene where the vulture first takes flight is probably the first good looking thing we've seen in the series up to this point, and shines as an example of good use of 3D CG. I just wish that the characters and the world around them would have been 2D. That way, they could have more natural looking movements, and be able to express emotion more distinctively. With that being said, I think we've spent enough time talking about this movie, and it's now time to move on to the grand finale. Godzilla the Planet Eater is easily the most ambitious of the series. Going completely all out on the metaphorical representations and bringing out every mythical element into this story of the divine against nature. But that being said, this film also manages to be both the most conceptually interesting of the bunch, with lots of abstract imagery and metaphysical properties, but also the one with the absolute worst this series has to present. Let me explain. The film begins with a recap of the prior two films from the perspective of Metaphys, and how all of these events piece together into something greater, and so on. It is also shown that he has organized something of a cult with the survivors of the events of City on the Edge of Battle. He makes them believe that their survival up until this point is all a blessing from the Ex-Chief God specifically stating that their resistance against the fusion with nanometal meant that they have been blessed. Of course, Haro and the doctor of the team don't buy into this. They question Metaphys and find out that he's basically alluring them into a sick kind of drinking the Kool-Aid ruse, so I guess it would actually be more accurate to say that the Ex-Chief are the Heaven's Gate kind of people? N not too sure. Although, instead of worshipping UFOs, it's an intergalactic space dragon that shoots gravity beams out of its mouths. Somehow still makes more sense than the universe people though. Then the usual plot dodging happens, only this time we get something that I was not expecting at all when Haro bangs up one of the bug people. 
I mean, <laughs> what do I even say about this? Let me tell you, when I start watching a Godzilla movie, the last thing I expect to see on my screen is Formicophilia. Just, what is this? Somebody at Toho's fetish? This is your doing Urobuchi-san, isn't it? I guess this is what happens to your brain when you write a screenplay for a movie called Puella Magi Madoka Magica The Movie Part 3 Rebellion. What's wrong with you?! Nah, I'm just kidding. The animation actually looks pretty cool. I mean, it's just so off-putting that I couldn't find a coherent way to describe them in my notes. And if that wasn't strange enough, it turns out that these bug people have... <laughs> telepathic abilities? Hell, it gets even more interesting from there when we see a dream sequence where Metaphys cooks up and serves a fine French consommé à la cockroach. I actually just don't even know how to decipher this one. Anyway, it turns out that Metaphys' plan, along with the rest of the Exchief, the entire time was to summon Ghidorah and offer the Earth as a sacrifice or something of the sort. He gathers his cult members to perform the Ghidorah summoning ritual, which is successful, and kills many of the survivors as well as the entirety of the mothership that has been orbiting Earth for the last two movies. The seemingly boundless Ghidorah descends down from the heavens and attacks the land below it, bestowing itself upon the helpless land deity. I hope what I said translated as interesting, because the reality is... A little bit something closer to this. As this is happening, Haro confronts Metaphys who is guiding the monster into this realm. They then enter some sort of telepathic realm where Metaphys portrays his true nature as the bringer of destruction to various planets. The bug people manage to communicate with their version of a god, which is an unhatched Mothra to bring that whole bug thing full circle. Through Mothra, they manage to communicate with Haruo, who is still in this telepathic vision, and tell him that Ghidorah is being controlled. Before they can tell him by who, which I'm not even entirely sure is necessary at this point, Metaphys shows Haruo that it was he who was responsible for the deaths of the elderly first shown in Planet of the Monsters. Then there's some heavy-handed symbolism with Haruo's name, which basically means springtime. Anyway, he is able to break free of Metaphys' telepathy, and destroy the amulet he's had in his eye that has allowed Ghidorah to be guided. With the amulet destroyed, Godzilla annihilates Ghidorah. Metaphys dies, and thus brings us to the conclusion. The Oh so wonderful conclusion. We're shown a world where the humans and the bug people live together in harmony. A very simple, happy ending that easily could have capped off the series. But instead, we're shown that a vulture from the last movie survived. Not only that, but the nanometal from it could be used to further rebuild the society they once knew. Upon hearing this, Haro hears the voice of Metaphys in his head, basically letting him know that the curse of Ghidorah still lives, and that the cycle of destruction is destined to continue. So very, very out of the blue, Haruo leaves his pregnant bug friend, grabs the sergeant lady, gets into the vulture, confronts Godzilla like a five-year-old, and is shot down. We get a pan over to some symbolic flowers, and then... Cut to black. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullsh**. <sighs> <sighs> okay. So I'm just going to be flat out honest with you all. I think this movie is just bad. When I was watching it, I didn't find many issues with it, aside from the ending, but when you look back on it as a whole, it just falls apart. In attempting to be a monumental, complex conclusion, it manages to throw away so, so much that could have been established before that could have been legitimately interesting, and would feel like a much better payoff. I know talking about what could have been isn't exactly fair, so let's instead discuss what there is. And what there is comes out to be an extremely confusing mess that's too focused on the metaphors and analogies that it forgets to try and tell a compelling or satisfying story. 
Not to mention the abysmal ending that just feels like a slap in the face of anybody who devoted their time and interest into this trilogy. It fails to really make a statement as a cohesive unit, and only succeeds in presenting multiple, almost uncorrelated pieces of a story that all feel very stagnant. It's interesting to compare the notes I have for this movie and the other two, because it's so clear that there is such a massive divergence to the point where I could not tell what was significant enough to warrant renumbering. And the worst part of it is that as I'm sitting here typing this up, I can't for the life of me remember most of the movie. And considering how there's so little that happens, that's a pretty bad sign. It's a lot more abstract and conceptual when compared to its two prequels, but that just doesn't end up working in its favor. Also, don't get me wrong here, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being abstract or conceptual or anything of the sort. As a matter of fact, just before watching these movies, I had recently finished watching Twin Peaks for the first time, and despite easily being the most abstract piece of media I have ever seen by a country mile, it not only works, but manages to have unparalleled style and substance with it, all while still being able to evoke emotion at the same time. The Planet Eater, on the other hand, almost feels like it's abstract for the sake of being abstract. I bring this up because of just how extremely pan this movie is. Everybody cites it as being extremely boring, a waste of time, a missed opportunity, and so on. And for the most part, I really can't disagree. Although, I think the reality is not so much that people are bored by its abstraction or divergence, but more so that they can see straight through the ploy. They know that a lot of this imagery comes down to padding, or needless meandering that builds to, simply put, one of the worst constructed endings to a film I have seen in a long time. Just to clarify, a movie having an ending that isn't a happy one doesn't automatically make it poor in execution. For an amazing example, just look at Old Boy. It's the fact that this character we've been following for three films, who is shown to be this strong, resilient type, gives up very suddenly, and in what is probably the weakest scene of the series. Yes, he does show weakness and suspicion every once in a while, but the rush to his conclusion is just maddening. In this scene that is supposed to convey the emotional end for our hero, who is pouring out his heart to the people he has come to know and love after fighting for his home, I felt absolutely nothing. It translates as this very awkward, very stilted melodrama that left me with a feeling of frustration more than anything else. Not frustration like they wanted me to feel, but frustration that the conflict was again avoided, and the conclusion was made without a foundation. So now that I'm already somewhat touching upon the trilogy as a whole, I figure now would be a good time to transition to a discussion as to how everything fits together overall. If I had to describe the Godzilla Earth Trilogy in one word, it would certainly be disappointing. The idea of taking this incredible monster and making it become so powerful that the environment around it practically becomes the monster itself is a unique one, and has a lot of interesting directions you could take it. However, individually, these films manage to present very different chapters in this story that seemingly have next to no cohesion with each other. If I'm being honest, it feels like each one of these ends with no idea where the next one is going to begin. I know this can't be the case, but when you're looking at the endings of each of these films, which is a very abrupt cut to black in the middle of a scene, they really don't build off of each other. 
and whatever is left of that ending is set up as some form of conflict in the next film that will likely have no resolution. Something I did not talk about in The Planet Eater is how the Bilisaludo take over the mothership and cut off power for everybody on board. Their goal being to keep it this way until Haruo is arrested for his betrayal. So, why did I ignore that plot point? Well, aside from the mothership practically being a non-factor after some time in Planet of the Monsters, that's because this plot point, just like many others, is completely inconsequential and remains unresolved. Before any agreement or anything of the sort, Ghidorah completely destroys the ship. This leaves a decent size of the runtime being nothing more than fluff. The remaining survivors already could not get back on there, and it's been doing very little aside from just being there. The arguing and the bickering that takes place over Haruo ultimately leads to nothing. I honestly believe it would have been much more interesting to have Godzilla destroy the mothership in City on the Edge of Battle. Considering it was established in the early stages of that movie, I feel it would have been much more interesting to have a battle against time. To see if Godzilla could be killed before it could destroy the mothership. It apparently already has some strange means of sensing people, so why not? It would have added an element of surprise and one thing that this series has no concept of. Payoff. Then, in The Planet Eater, it would feel a lot more fitting that the survivors would be so void of their morale that they finally turn to the X-Sheaf and their rhetoric. That's me discussing what could have been instead of what was, but it's really hard not to when you can see the plethora of missed opportunity here. Going back to the first movie, as I said before, most, if not all of this movie, really just doesn't need to exist. I keep looking back on it and wonder what it was about it that Toho felt was necessary, and the only answer I could come up with is that sweet Godzilla money. The mini Godzilla species is limited to that one movie, and really only serves as a measuring stick for the real Godzilla. Not to mention the other monsters that do appear in the other movies, but amount to what feels like very little, if anything at all. If we had the establishment of Planet of the Monsters with the action of City on the Edge of Battle, I think we'd see a lot more cohesion, a lot less meandering, and it would probably be a lot more interesting to watch as opposed to feeling like a chore to watch that it is. Then the Planet Eater could have had a lot more footing to stand on, and the sudden change to abstraction wouldn't be so jarring. Regardless, together, they stand as very clunky, very awkward, and very incoherent. It's a shame that these are supposed to be connected parts of a trilogy, because if it weren't for the most simple of conjoining factors, it just wouldn't feel that way. Tonally, they're all different. Pacing-wise, they're all over the place. Narratively, they don't sit well together. And overall, they're just a big, disappointing mess. Sadly, one of the few things I can say that they manage to do consistently is their inconsistency. Although, I'll give them credit where it's due. They did manage to tie in thematic colors consistently that corresponded with the intended emotions of the film. It's a nice touch, but that one plus just doesn't save this trilogy from its massive shortcomings. And now having discussed the trilogy as a whole, I think it's about time we bring this to an end. Back when I heard about the upcoming Godzilla Monster Planet, as it was originally titled, I was elated. I was so excited to see what the monster could do without the constraints of a suit or the real world for that matter. 
I was ready to see something new, something fresh, something exciting. Something that I could look back on as one of the fonder periods in Godzilla's history. I remember sitting down for the first time to watch it, and being showered with this feeling of disappointment. I held on to hope that this was only one piece of a grander scheme. The hope that the films that followed it would be grandiose and full of action, narrative, and enjoyment. However, what I got instead was not only under-delivered, but actually found ways to become progressively worse. I hate to critique something that I like so much, because at the end of the day, I want to like it. We have this monster that is a manifestation of destruction, a symbol of the cruelty of war, and much, much more. And all we get here is what feels like unpolished themes, a confused story, and a monster that feels nothing like Godzilla. Everything here suffers so much from taking a backseat to the themes and symbolism without an interesting story, relatable characters, or anything of the sort. Those messages just aren't going to resonate with people. It's implemented into each one of these movies to try and give them more significance and weight. But even though I actually like the ideals they're attempting to portray here and find them interesting, the portrayal itself is far far too weak. And again, I'm not alone in feeling that way. There's too much meandering, too much of a build-up to things that never come to be. So many empty promises that had potential to be something of relevance, but it keeps falling flat on its face over and over and over again. Ultimately, I find the Godzilla Earth trilogy to be an extremely disappointing, garbled mess and a missed opportunity to integrate one of the most beloved Japanese icons into a medium that he's never been featured in before. With that being said, I know that there is a fair share of people that see something in these films that maybe I'm not seeing, and I don't want them to feel like me critiquing this trilogy means that they can't enjoy it. If anything, I'm glad that there are people out there that see things differently than I do. That way, there's a discussion to be had, and a way to understand why we feel the way we do. At the end of the day, this is still the monster that we collectively know and love. In being able to talk about this, whether positive or negative, I can only see the betterment of this icon's portrayal in the future. If there's one thing I think I've learned from watching these movies, it's actually seeing just how passionate people are about Godzilla and his movies. The fanbase that follows him is a loyal and dedicated one. One that is always eagerly anticipating the next movie, or the next video game, or whatever else there might be. It's just fascinating to see how something that represented such vile and heinous actions over time has become a way for us to connect and engage with one another. And I think that's ultimately the magic of it all. And for that, I am thankful. But anyway, whether you enjoyed this trilogy or not, there's still plenty more to come, and I know we're all ready for the King of the Monsters to rise up and bring us all together once again. Hello there everyone, and thank you for watching. I know a lot of you have been asking for this one for a while now, and I'm really glad I finally managed to crank this one out and let you all watch it. Also, hey! why don't you go ahead and check out my Patreon? There, you can find a growing selection of commentary tracks, including the tracks for the films in this trilogy, which you can also find by supporting me through the channel membership option available here on YouTube. With that being said, I've got some more videos I'm working on right now that I know a lot of you have been requesting, and I hope to bring them to you as soon as possible, and hopefully not take as long as this one. But until next time, I'll see you all later. Thanks for watching.